Hi there, and welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're talking about scientific realism and anti-realism. So our topic today concerns what is real? How do we know? What sort of attitude should we have towards the claims that science makes when those claims are about things that we can't just see uh, in our ordinary everyday lives, right? Um, all the claims that science makes about what will be, the laws that science posits, the sorts of entities that it concerns. Are these things real? Should we believe in them? That's what we're talking about here today. We, we talk about scientific realism. I think it's important first to start with just the term realism, right? What does it mean to be a realist or to accept realism about anything? It, it, it means different things when we're talking about different kinds of realis, realism. So I could be realist about consciousness, right? My phenomenal consciousness, the, ex the objects as I experience them, right? That's not a very heavyweight commitment, although some people would deny that what I, the way I think of my conscious experiences is real. Um, um, on the other hand, the, if I'm a realist about the objects of my everyday perceptions, the tables, chairs, um, plants and puppy dogs and so forth, then I'm committed to the existence of those objects right? and perhaps to the truth of certain claims about those objects or at least their approximate truth or some, some slightly more fallibilistic notion than truth simpliciter. When we talk about scientific realism, we're making a kind of realist commitment to something that science tells us about. So we're making a realist commitment to the content of scientific theories or the objects that the scientific theories are about, to the truth or reality of those theories or, or entities, um, or, or at least some subset thereof. Now, in our discussions of scientific realism, there are kind of, uh, there are kind of three major dimensions. On the one hand, uh, there is a kind of metaphysical commitment in scientific realism, a commitment to the existence of a mind-independent reality that science purports to be about. The second major dimension or, or claim of scientific realism or type of scientific realism is a semantic dimension, right? This is a claim about the interpretation of scientific theories or scientific claims. Um, a scientific realist is committed to interpreting those literally, right, as claims about um, objects in the same way that our everyday d discourse is to be interpreted literally um, as, as making claims about the world around us. And then the epistemological dimension of scientific realism tells us something about the um, the record of scientific achievement. Should we believe that that it is accurately approximating the truth about the world, right? The epistemological dimension it says that science is actually delivering us knowledge um, above and beyond uh, what sort of everyday knowledge tells us about. So we think about these three dimensions uh, and the denial of any one of these dimensions then gives us a type of anti-realism, right? So uh, the um, denial of the metaphysical commitment of realism uh, is a denial of a mind-independent reality, right? So one way of denying that there's a mind-independent reality is to be a certain kind of um, idealist, right? So you might say, look, the only thing that exists is the mind, or everything that exists is dependent on the mind or on some kind of pre-existing mental or conceptual structure, right? So various kinds of of idealism are, um, are, are anti-realisms in this sense, scientific anti-realisms in this sense. Many contemporary anti-realists are not so much um, idealists, but they might be, for example, they might have a kind of Kantian view that tells us that you know, wh whatever exists in and, in and of itself is inaccessible to us, and the world of our experience and the world of our scientific practice is one that is kind of co-constituted by the mind, right? By our theories, our um, concepts, uh, and, and so on, right? So that is a kind of denial of a mind-independent reality. The denial of the semantic form of realism involves the reinterpretation of theoretical claims as, as non-literal claims, um, not literally claims about unseen objects, 
um, and uh, or powers or laws or whatever, but rather as a kind of compact compact descriptions of um, something else, right? So, or covert descriptions of something else, right? So there's a kind of empiricist version of this that tells us that scientific theoretical claims are just shorthand for uh, more complicated empirical descriptions that can be reduced to claims about observable objects. What we call instrumentalism is the view that theoretical claims should be interpreted not as literal claims, but only as instruments for prediction and control, right? So, so observational prediction and experimental control of the world. Um, and uh, there, there are other versions of that as well. And then finally, the uh, denial of the epistemological claim um, involves a denial uh, uh, that the theoretical claims are true um, or that the unobservable entities posited in those <coughs> claims. So it's a denial or at least a withholding of belief about the, the truth of the theoretical claims or the reality of the unobservable entities posited by science, right? And you can see that one could be a realist in one respect, but a um, anti-realist in another respect. For example, you could um, acknowledge the metaphysical thesis and say that there is a mind independent reality. You can uh, endorse the semantic thesis and say, look, science does make literal claims about the nature of the world, including claims about things that we cannot observe. Um, but we're not confident that science has the power to deliver knowledge about those things, right? So we are agnostic about those claims. That would be an epistemological form of anti-realism. Actually, probably the most popular or um, well-regarded form of anti-realism in the contemporary scene, which is known as constructive empiricism, it does precisely that. It, it is metaphysically and semantically realist, but epistemologically anti-realist. So why should we not be realists? What, what, what are some of the reasons that we might consider for denying realism? Um, uh, I mean, you might think that realism is a kind of default position. Science is very uh, sophisticated form of knowledge production and we should be realists about what it tells us. I mean, what else are we gonna believe, right? But there are some pretty significant arguments, some of which builds on what we've talked about in previous weeks. Um, that, that at least raise some doubts about realism, right? So one of these is um, the theory ladenness of observation. Remember that um, a number of, of thinkers, including Kuhn and Feyerabend, have told us that uh, the theories that we hold actually, um, to a large extent, influence our interpretation uh, of observation the, the way in which we translate our experience into descriptions of the world in such a way that um, you might think uh, the current theories that we believe are infecting our, our data in a certain way. So there's a certain kind of potential circularity at work, right? So in other words, um, you might think that it is a powerful uh, way in which science predicts and explains our observations that gives us a reason to be realist, but if those observations themselves are not kind of neutral arbiter or, or external criteria, but are themselves influenced by or created by the theories um, that we have come up with in science, uh, it raises serious questions about um, whether that's a good ground for realist commitment. A similar issue is um, raised by what, it, what we've called the underdetermination of theory by data, right? This is the idea that multiple uh, theories might equally well um, explain a certain body of data, right? As far as we, as far as um, the history of science goes, we have some reason to think that uh, there are multiple possible options for developing our knowledge. Um, and even if we don't see underdetermination that often in the history as a logical matter, we can imagine that different theories might explain that we have not considered might explain the data equally well, right? And if there are multiple logically incompatible theories for any set of data, again, that raises the question of whether the data is adequate to um, sort of justify belief in a one particular theory. 
the kind of um, historical stories that Kuhn and Feyerabend tell us um, in which there are radical revolutionary changes and incommensurability between different theoretical um, perspectives or paradigms also raises concerns about scientific realism. Um, and again, similarly to theory ladenness and underdetermination, the issue is, you know, can we find a neutral uh, or um, sort of independent uh, criterion for um, uh, what makes a theory a good theory and what makes it worthy of belief? And if theories aren't really comparable, um, if, uh, if progress is not, we can't sort of track progress over long scales of time, then it raises questions about whether we should be committed to a form of realism. One very powerful argument uh, against realism it comes from the history of science, and it is sometimes called the pessimistic induction or the pessimistic meta-induction. And the basic idea here is, if we look at the history of science, we see a number of, a number of examples of very sort of well-established ideas, theories, claims, um, entities. In the scientific literature, they are, um, they are sort of objects of to a large degree of scientific consensus. They are powerful in uh, helping us predict and explain the world around us. And yet, subsequent changes in, the his changes in science, sort of over historical time, have led us to reject those theories, to deny those theoretical claims, to remove those entities from our, our lexicon or our sort of um, uh, our understanding of the world, right? So if we look at chemistry, right, there's a period of, uh, in which the concept of phlogiston as the sort of chemical in, uh, element responsible for combustion is a fairly well-established part of a, of a fairly sophisticated set of th chemical theories. Um, and yet, uh, if we look at uh, the sort of modern chemical revolution, there is no place for any entity like phlogiston, right? Um, if we think about uh, changes in the history of physics from um, Aristotle to Newton, or better, from Newton to Einstein and to, from Newton to quantum mechanics, um, we see major revisions to our understanding of the basic sort of constituents of the world and the basic laws uh, of nature. This suggests that we should have a, a pretty um, skeptical attitude towards the commitments of our current science, which after all in the, in the fullness of history um, might be equally well rejected in, uh, in time, right? Mm -hmm and replaced by something something better. So if those are the arguments um, against re scientific realism, what kind of arguments can we muster in favor of realism? Um, and I think there are still a number of, uh, of sophisticated arguments in its favor. So um, one of them uh, is sort of the common, uh, the common sort of pairing with the pessimistic induction, and that's the no miracles argument, or sometimes simply the miracles argument. And the basic claim here is, if we look at uh, much of the science we have today, if we look at uh, our most sort of mature and successful sciences, they're very successful. The high degree of prediction and control, uh, very convincing explanations of various elements of the world around us. Um, it would be a miracle if, uh, if all of that success happened uh, and yet this sort of underlying uh, sort of structure or explanatory system that makes them those successes possible weren't true, right? Uh, to make that a little more concrete, um, we have a high uh, degree of predictive precision and accuracy in our contemporary physics. It would be a miracle that we would be so consistently successful if the physical laws and the kind of physical entities um, that are posited by those, those theories were not, were not real, right? That would, be, that would be a really surprising thing. Another reason that we might be realists, at least um, about 
uh, certain kinds of very successful science is that we have uh, what is sometimes called consilient evidence or what is sometimes called robust evidence or what we might call um, uh, multiple corroborations, right? And the idea here is, okay, um, we have, uh, suppose we have um, one technique for gathering evidence on a certain kind of phenomenon. Um, we can uh, see it in a scanning electron microscope, but not, not with any kind of ordinary observational techniques, but, but we can detect it with a scanning electron microscope. Now suppose there is a second, uh, a second kind of um, observational device uh, works on completely different physical principles using completely different physical mechanisms, and yet it also allows us to detect the same phenomenon multiple lines of evidence that are mutually independent from one another, the idea goes, um, give us a good reason to believe that uh, the thing that they're both uh, sort of providing evidence for is, is, is real, right? This points not to just the success of sort of one line of evidence, the strength of one line of evidence, but actually the um, sort of a, a process of triangulation from very different directions. This gives us reasons to be realist because the best explanation for both of these techniques working is that the thing the thing is really there right that's the idea of course for this kind of argument to go through you have to be sure that your different lines of evidence really are independent and that can be an issue in response to arguments like the pessimistic induction um, some scientific realists have become more selective about their realist commitment so they've they've agreed that you do see components of successful theories over time being rejected and replaced with very different things. Um, but they want to still insist that there are something that those older theories are getting right, something that is preserved in new theories, right? And so the goal of these realists is to identify what is the thing that is preserved across theory change, right? Um, or across paradigm shifts, you might say. One kind of view is that, uh, is, that sci is that for the most part, entities don't, uh, the, the sort of entities that the science is about don't change, even though our theories about those entities do change, right? So um, uh, once we've discovered the existence of atoms, our theories about the nature and constitution of atoms changes a lot over time but our commitment to atoms doesn't change. Our commitment to electrons doesn't change, even though we, under, we understand them very differently than, we, than uh, the scientists who first posited the existence of electrons did. And so that's, that's the idea of entity realism, a kind of selective realism focused on entities. Another kind of selective realism is, is called structural realism. And so it emphasizes not the entities that the science is about, but the mathematical structures that make um, the predictions work, right? For example, they might trace um, the existence of fairly similar sort of mathematical equations or, or mathematical structures um, through changes in different uh, stages of electromagnetic theory and say, look, from one theory to the other, we change a lot of our basic understanding of what's going on but the mathematical structure is preserved, right? So it's really, it's really structure that science uh, is, we should be realists about in science. Another kind of realism, which we might call a selective realism, is Ian Hacking's experimental realism, right? Um, and experimental realism, realism can be summed up with uh, the bumper sticker slogan, if you can spray it, it's real, right? Um, Hacking's idea is that uh, we may not be convinced uh, to have a realist commitment to something uh, that we have somehow detected. We've built a detector that gives us a positive indication that that thing exists. That, that we may sort of for theory ladenness and underdetermination and other kinds of reasons, be skeptical about those kind of detection claims. Um, but what Hacking says we can't really be skeptical about is when we then use those entities to affect something else, right? Um, 
the electron is is again a good example for hacking, right? So there's an earlier stage of science where we sort of indirect, we, well, there's a stage at which we posit the existence of electrons, but have no means to detect them um, uh, as a separate entity. Um, here he thinks it's merely, it's sort of merely speculative explanation. Then there's a point where we build detectors and we think we have detected the existence of electrons and we can even measure their charge. Um, but still, we might not be ready to be realists about electrons. But once we can do things like build a scanning electron microscope and use electrons to detect the features of other things, um, or we can build uh, certain other kinds of uh, devices that depend on the properties of electrons to alter other things, then we should be committed to the real reality of electrons. That's, that's experimental realism. So those are some basic arguments and ideas about scientific realism and anti-realism. I look forward to discussing the way that those ideas play out in the readings by Godfrey Smith, Loudon, and Hacking that we did for today, uh, for, for our class this week. Uh, I look forward to hearing what you think uh, here in the comments or on Discord uh, or in class. So otherwise, I will see you next week. Have a great week.